Hello everyone, uh, welcome as you join us for uh, this, the first online Bible study of the new year. Uh, I know we're a couple of weeks in, but a very happy new year to you all. And uh, we are continuing in our study today of the book of Revelation. And uh, since the hiatus, we are now moving into chapter 11 of Revelation. And you're very welcome uh, to open uh, a Bible if you have one handy or access to scripture. Uh, to follow uh, the text today from Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to read it first uh, and then we'll look at the study together. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told, Come and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For it is given over to the nations, and they will trample over the holy city for forty-two months. And I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, wearing sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. They have authority to shut the sky, so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying, and they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that is prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And the inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and celebrate an exchange presence. Because these two prophets had been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. And they stood on their feet. And those who saw them were terrified. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies watched them. At that moment there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest was terrified, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming very soon. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Then the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath has come for the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple and there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. And may God bless his word to us today. Before we start to look at the text, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I don't know if you're a mathematician or not, or someone who's relatively good at maths. And if you are, uh, you should be able to answer these uh, quite easily, I'm sure. First of all, the question, what is the fourth prime number? In the sequence of prime numbers, what is the fourth one? Give you a second to think about that and the answer is seven the number seven is the fourth prime number 
two, three and five come before it. It's a number that only one and itself can be divided into, which is a prime number. And the other mathematical question is, what is four cubed? Four to the power of three. What is the answer to that? And the answer is, it's four times four times four, which is 64. So if you've got those, well done uh, for the mathematical questions. Now you're probably wondering, why on earth is he asking mathematical questions at the start of the study? Well, if we look at Revelation 11, and you've probably picked it up as we read it together, it's a chapter full of numbers. There's all sorts of numbers in here and a code possibly to these numbers as well. And we're going to look at that as we go through the text now together. It is a passage full of all uh, amounts of numbers and times. Verse 1, as the chapter opens, John, who's the I in the first verse, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, come and measure the temple of God and the altar than those who worship there. So John was given a measuring rod. Now, this is nothing new to the audience that Revelation would have been given to uh, in its context and time. A measuring rod is also mentioned in the Old Testament in many places. And it was something that was used to actually measure buildings and usually was made out of bamboo. But the measuring rod also had a certain length and it usually was nine feet. It was a nine foot long piece of bamboo, usually gleaned somewhere from the Jordan Valley. And they were used in uh, measuring buildings uh, in these days. If you go back to Ezekiel, you'll find there uh, Ezekiel is given a task with a measuring rod too within his prophecy. And so John is given one of these. And he's told to measure the temple of God. So is there a temple in heaven? Remember, uh, the vision that John is having here is a huge, huge expanse of what heaven is like and what is going on in it. But is there a temple there? Or is it simply just the presence of God sitting there in heaven? We'll look a little later at that because the temple thing comes up a little bit later again in the passage and what that might be. First of all, I'm going to ask you another question. How many temples uh, have there been in Jewish history? How many temples have there been? Can you recall who built the first one? Their first one goes back quite a bit in the Old Testament and Solomon was the first builder of the first temple. There actually have been two temples in Jewish history. The current Wailing Wall that you may see on the news from time to time in Jerusalem is the remnant of the second temple. And do you know who built it? I maybe hear the words Nehemiah and Ezra being uh, shouted out from, uh, from behind the camera. But Nehemiah... He orchestrated the building of the second temple. He didn't actually build it himself. It was a man called Zerubbabel built the second temple under Nehemiah's instruction. You remember when the exiles were returning back into the Holy Land, the second temple was built. But who destroyed the first temple? Who destroyed the first temple? Well, it was the Babylonians. When the people were taken into exile in the first place, Solomon's temple was destroyed. And so Nehemiah was given uh, this command to go and build the second temple. And Zerubbabel was the man who put his hand to it and built it with all his men. So who destroyed the second temple? Well, that was the Romans in AD 70. So if we put that timeline of that temple thinking together. The temple of God here in verse 1 cannot be a stone structure because both temples are destroyed perhaps they're no longer needed because remember when Jesus died we worship the Father direct now the temple wasn't needed anymore and therefore the altar of sacrifice was not needed anymore Jesus was the final sacrifice for all sins 
So this temple in heaven is much more an analogous temple. And there is no altar, remember, in heaven. This again is an analogy that to remind us that Jesus is the final sacrifice and his presence in heaven with God the Father. So this temple that is mentioned here in heaven, it could be seen as a third temple, but it could also simply be the people of God who are present in heaven. Remember, when we think of church today, it's a place where we gather, yes, but the church is the people of God, not the building. We can meet in a field and worship God. As long as the people are there, that is the church of God. And perhaps this temple is simply the people of God. But how do you measure people? Because the verse tells us, come and measure the temple and those who worship there. Can you imagine this nine foot measuring rod coming out uh, trying to measure people? What does this actually mean? Well, it talks about measuring, but it's in an exhaustive sense. In other words, those who are worshipping there, they're not being measured literally, but the number of them present in heaven is exhaustive. In other words, there's one day will come when heaven's doors will be closed and no more people can enter it. In other words, there will be a defined number. Even though the Bible tells us there's myriads upon myriads of people in heaven, God knows exactly how many are there. It's a measurable number in his eyes. So one day heaven will close its doors. When grace is no longer present on this earth, heaven's doors will be closed. So this is what's going on in this verse. Come and measuring the temple. Come and measuring the people. But then verse 2 tells us, Do not measure the court outside the temple. Now, if you've ever seen a picture or a blueprint of Solomon's temple, you can find them sometimes in churches, uh, these, these pictures hanging up of the temple. Or you may have seen a 3D model uh, of the temple uh, of, of Judaism back in Solomon's day. And it's a wonderful structure, but there are all sorts of courtyards as you make your way into the very central area. And the very central area of the temple is the Holy of Holies. You remember where the high priest went in once a year to atone for the sins of the people. And only he was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And outside of that was another area where the priests would have been, the Jewish priests. Outside of that, another area where the Jewish people uh, would have been confined. They wouldn't be allowed any further in unless they were priests. And outside of that again were the Gentiles' courtyard. They were not allowed to mix with the Jewish people at the temple. They had to stay outside as they were seen as unbelievers. And that the pain of death would have gone any further into the more holier Jewish circles within the temple. So we see that in verse 2. Don't measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, God says. And here again we have that picture of the temple. That those outside are those still not in Christ. And in some ways will never come to Christ. Because God has now closed them out. They've had their chance. They will be outside heaven's walls if they are not in Christ. So in other words, what's the point of measuring outside of heaven? It's given over to the nations and they trample over the holy city for 42 months. The holy city, Jerusalem, another name for it. Jerusalem, of course, still in existence. But it's talking about here that these people who don't trust in Christ will trample over it for 42 months. Here we have our first number in this passage. 42 months is three and a half years. And that number three and a half comes up quite regularly in this chapter. And we're going to look at the meaning of that uh, very shortly. If we look at verse 3, we see two people uh, very pertinent in chapter 11 arriving. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days wearing sackcloth. Here we have two witnesses. Who are these people? We're not told in the passage who these people are. 
But there are indicators later on this, this scripture who they might be. They're given authority, so authority from God to prophesy. Very important people. They're going to bring the word of God again. You remember God's grace is still operating here at the minute. He's still wanting his people to hear his word, even in the middle of tribulation and towards the end times. And another number, 1,260 days. Now, what is that in years? Again, it's three and a half. This is the 42 months broken down into days. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, let me work that out, Jeffrey. It is slightly more in our calendar. 1,260 days seems to fall a wee bit short of three and a half years in our calendar as days go. But remember, this is a Jewish calendar from a 2,000 year ago period. And as 1,260 is three and a half years. And these witnesses are going to speak the word of God in that time period, wearing sackcloth, which is an indicator of a prophet. Prophets wore sackcloth because of their mourning for the people and their sinful ways and being so far from God. You may have heard the phrase sackcloth and ashes. They would have sat in ashes, wore sackcloth, and sometimes too scraped themselves with pots herds is what the Bible talks about. In other words, that's broken pottery and they scraped themselves, their arms and legs, to bring blood to the surface. Such was their mourning for the sins of the people. So the two witnesses have this three and a half year period uh, to speak the word of God. Now remember, this is the first half of the tribulation, all this period. The second half of the tribulation period is also three and a half years. And if you put those two uh, numbers together, what do you get? Seven. God's perfect number. And that's the length of time, according to Revelation, of the period of tribulation. And so the two witnesses are now present within this time. Well, I'm going to throw out to you a possibility who these two people are. And there are indicators, as I say later on in the passage, to who these people may be. First of all, some people believe the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah, who had already lived in the Old Testament. Enoch, you remember way, way back in Genesis, Someone who disappeared, his body was never found. It's believed that he never died and went to heaven still alive. Elijah is the other person in the Old Testament who did the same. Only he is recorded as going up in a chariot, leaving Elisha behind, his successor. And Elisha has recorded this, that he's seen Elijah going into heaven in a chariot who did not die before he went. And there are indicators towards this further on. Some people believe it's Elijah and Moses. And remember, Moses' death is highly shady. No one knows, according to the Bible, where he's buried. They have an idea of the area where he died, but no one ever found a body. And if he died on his own, as he was told to go and die on his own, who would have buried him? It's also shady stuff where Moses actually died. So we have these almost mythical type deaths for these three men. Enoch, Elijah and Moses. I want to bring you to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. This is one of the indicators as to one of the witnesses is possibly Elijah. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now remember Elijah had done all his wonderful stuff in the Old Testament. And he went back to heaven. But Malachi now is prophesying that Elijah is going to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Which hasn't happened yet. So perhaps one of these witnesses is Elijah. Let's look at verse 4. There are two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Now again, where in the Old Testament has this been spoken of before? Two olive trees and two lampstands. It's in the book of Zechariah. And what is happening here is two lampstands, they are spreading light. 
two olive trees. Olives remind us of fruitfulness, of something that's growing, of something that is good. So the light of God through the witnesses, in other words, bringing the gospel into the world again, is the lampstand side, the olive trees, is the fruitfulness of the message and how it can change lives. Straight from Zechariah, but also present here in Revelation. And if anyone wants to harm them, verse 5, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. Anyone who wants to harm them must be killed in this manner. Sounds uh, quite vicious and violent. Fire pours out from the witnesses' mouths. And anyone coming against the gospel and the speaking that the witnesses are doing, they're going to meet with death at this stage. So woe betide anyone that comes against the two witnesses in these days and uh, comes against the word of God. The gospel is going to be proclaimed with mighty power because fire is going forward in vengeance to those who come against the message of God. Now fire is giving us another clue towards who the two witnesses might be. How does that give us a clue? Well, most people who are theologians point towards the witnesses being Moses and Elijah rather than Elijah and Enoch. And there are reasons for this. Elijah went to heaven in a chariot of fire. Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai, which was always ablaze with fire. God's presence symbolism of fire so the witnesses there's a symbolism into their past life when they were in the old testament that they were akin to fire in their story and read on verse 6 they have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Again, here we have stuff that's leading us back to both Moses and Elijah and what they did in the Old Testament. No rain. Do you remember the story when Elijah predicted there'd be no rain? And it came to be there was a drought in the country. Do you know how long that lasted? Three and a half years. So here we have the number creeping back in. And also the mention of plagues. Where do we see plagues in Moses' time? In Egypt. Remember God sent the ten plagues. And the first of those was turning the waters into blood. Which again is here in verse 6. Pointing ever closer to both Moses and Elijah as the two witnesses. Now it all looks good for the world here in the sense for a Christian that the gospel is going forward and woe betide anybody who goes against it. But verse 7 turns the whole thing in his head again. When they had finished their testimony, the two witnesses, in other words, when they finished preaching the word, the beast comes up from the bottomless pit and he'll make war on the witnesses and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of that great city that was prophetically called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So what does all this mean? Well, the beast, the beast, of course, is one of the hierarchy in the satanic world. We'll see a bit more of it or him later on in further chapters of Revelation. But the beast comes out of the bottomless pit, which is hell. And the beast has been sent from the realms of Satan, one of Satan's uh, hierarchical creatures to bring destruction to the world. Now, we don't see clearly here whether God allows this or whether the beast is gathering power in his own right. All we know is he comes up out of the bottomless pit, but unfortunately, the two witnesses who seemed uh, undefeatable are now killed by this beast. And war is made on them. And their dead bodies will be strewn on the street. 
discard it like rubbish on the street. In a great city called Sodom and Egypt. Well, yes, we're aware of those two words in the Bible, but how come they're two places in one? How come they're one city? But please note the word prophetically called that. If I was to throw out to the word to use Sodom, what does that remind you of? Apart from the obvious, Sodom was a place of great sin. Egypt, what does that remind you of? The captivity of the Israelites when Moses led them out from that. So here we have sin and captivity. And it's speaking of Jerusalem. The holy city, but yet so much sin in it and so much captivity to sin. So anyone who's living in sin is captive to the will of sin. And not only Jerusalem, but the wider world. And that's why Sodom and Egypt are in here, together in one city. Because we know it's Jerusalem, because it says where also their Lord was crucified, where Jesus died. And the dead bodies of the witnesses are lying there. And again, now verse 9, three and a half. Three and a half days this time, members of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze up their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. In other words, let them rot. They don't deserve a grave even. Can you imagine that scene? And these people all staring at them. These are people outside of Christ. These are people outside of receiving the gospel. And they're glad that they're dead. Verse 10. The inhabitants of the earth. Remember that phrase? That is everyone who's outside of God's salvation yet. They'll gloat over the dead bodies and celebrate and exchange gifts, exchange presents. Such a celebration they're going to have when the two witnesses die. In other words, you can imagine them almost relieved that God's word is not allowed to be preached anymore. And because these two prophets have been a torment to the inhabitants of the earth by their words, they would refuse to listen to the word of God. And it's almost like a relief that the two men are now dead. The beast has begun this. He is an antichrist. He is someone who wants to conquer again on behalf of Satan. Remember Satan's powers continue to work through Revelation. He comes and he goes with his power, still skirmishing to the very end, even though the victory is won at the cross by Jesus. He'll still fight to the bitter end, as we'll find toward the end of the book of Revelation. It is interesting too, if I just want to highlight from these last couple of verses, verse 9 and 10, it says here the numbers of peoples, tribes and languages and nations that will gaze at the dead bodies of the witnesses. They're going to gloat and celebrate. It's speaking of the whole world here. Because how can the whole world observe two men lying on the streets of Jerusalem at once? It certainly couldn't happen in Revelation's day. Uh, in other words, when the vision was given by John almost 2,000 years ago. But please see this in a futuristic way. Think about today's world, the technology we have, a TV screen, a laptop, an iPad, a phone, a watch that can let you see stuff and see news. Technology is endless. Any of us can see anything at any time, at any point in the world, if it's there to be seen. So that's how the peoples of the world can see the two witnesses dying or dead on the streets. It's speaking of a world where everyone can see it at once. So when we look at that, and then moving on, we get another great bright light again, a lot more optimism. In verse 11, after the three and a half days, when the bodies were lying there, the breath of life of God enters the two witnesses again, and they stand on their feet. And those who see them are terrified. Well, you can imagine that. Uh, these guys are rising from the dead as these people see them. 
and they're terrified. Or in uh, an earlier translation or earlier scripture, terrified in this sense means amazed. To be amazed that these men are back up again. The power of God has re-entered them. And that Moses and Elijah, who we believe are the two witnesses, are both alive again. Which is interesting because remember that Elijah didn't die physically. And it's almost like he's died physically this time in his return to earth. Moses, again, remember the shady death of Moses and where he may be buried, where he may not be buried. And again, he rises from the dead. And they hear a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And both the witnesses go up in a cloud and the enemies are standing watching them. A bit like Elisha did as Elijah went up into heaven. Come up here and the witnesses are returned to heaven in glory. And at that moment, verse 13, there's a great earthquake and a tenth of the city falls. 7,000 people are killed in the earthquake and the rest are terrified and give glory to the God of heaven. So at that moment, when the witnesses return to heaven, a great earthquake happens. And this is quite common in Revelation. A tenth of the city falls. Now, again, it's speaking of Jerusalem. This earthquake causes, now at first light, this may seem it's bricks and mortar that are falling. A tenth of the city falls. But when an earthquake hits something, it's never as precise as that. When an earthquake brings its wanton destruction into an area, it takes as much as it can with it. And usually it's very difficult to kind of term it in a, an exact amount like that of destruction. A tenth of the city falls. Does that mean that nine tenths of it is still grand? My experience of, of seeing earthquakes and reading about them, that's not usually the case. But 7,000 people are killed in that earthquake. Perhaps that's what it means. A tenth of the city falls in the sense of human beings. A tenth of the city dies. So 7,000 people are killed as a tenth of the city, bringing a total of 70,000 people present in Jerusalem at that time. It's one view upon it. You may disagree. You may see it in a different light. But they're killed in the earthquake. And the rest are terrified. Again, the rest are amazed at what has happened. And give glory to the God of heaven. Now that is very unusual. Why on earth would someone give glory to God if they've just escaped with their lives of an earthquake? I think this is a verse of conversion. I think there are... An amount of people in Jerusalem who have witnessed this and they see it as an act of God, the work of God. They understand it, they have received it and they give their lives to him. Why else would they give glory to the God of heaven? So I think it is a verse of conversion of what they've seen as an act of God amongst them. It's a very interesting verse at the end of this section of the two witnesses. Verse 14, this is all part of the second woe. Believe it or not, the woes aren't over. There's a third one coming. And that comes now when the seventh trumpet is blown by the seventh angel. Remember, this period we've looked at is all in this sixth trumpet. The seventh trumpet is now coming. The last of the trumpet uh, times, the, the last of the trumpet uh, judgments upon the world. It is now upon us. Verse 15. The seventh angel blows his trumpet. And there are loud voices in heaven saying. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. And of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. And then the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God. Fall on their faces and worship God singing. We give you thanks Lord God Almighty. Who are and who were. For you have taken great power. And begun to reign. So here we have again another song. Remember we've seen songs already in heaven. Here's another one. After the seventh trumpet is blown. So we have the winning for Christ. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. So more and more people are still entering heaven. And of his Messiah he will reign forever and ever. That's the eternal aspect of course of God. And of heaven. But just look for a wee moment at a link between verse 15 and verse 17, just the way the, the words are written. 
the kingdom of the world has become. Okay, so it's, it's happening. It hasn't been there always. It's, it's happening now. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. And verse 17 says this. You have taken your great power and begun to reign. Now, why does John write that? God has always reigned, surely, from the beginning of time and always will reign. Why is he only beginning to reign here at this point? What is John trying to say here in the vision of Revelation? The kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and that God is only beginning to reign. Well, what I want to throw out to you now is a little bit about what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is present in the world now. It's present in the world when Jesus was here. But it's not fully completed yet. It's something that's growing and building as we are now. But until Jesus comes back, it is not fully completed. It is not fully realised. And so what John is trying to say to us here is this kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord. In other words, it's getting bigger and bigger. And the kingdom of God is the people of God and all that pertains to righteousness and holiness within that. It's growing as more and more give their lives to Christ and begins to reign. Not that he isn't reigning already, but begins to reign in the completed sense of the fullness of the kingdom. That will come one day. The fullness of the kingdom of God will be complete. And in that sense, God is reigning in that full entirety within that kingdom. He is in control. He is reigning already. But remember, he's still battling with evil. He's still battling with the forces of darkness and Satan. And when the kingdom of God is fully realized, fully complete, when Jesus returns, that's the style of reign it's talking about here. So that's what it means by beginning to reign. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were. It's plural, speaking of the Trinity here. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And verse 18, we're nearly finished. Verse 18. These are words pertaining to the last days. The nations raged. But your wrath has come, and the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints. And remember, all who trust in Christ are a saint. And all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. And finally, verse 19, the last verse of this chapter today. God's temple there. We started with the temple. We finished with the temple. Remember, there is not a stone temple as such in heaven because God is the temple and the people by extension who follow him are part of his temple. The Ark of his covenant is seen within his temple. Now, where was the Ark of the covenant in the Bible? The Old Testament again. Remember, it was a gold laid box and it had cherubim and, and seraphim type uh, carvings on it and was very ornate in the way it was built, and had two long handles on either side, which the Levites, the priests of, of that day, carried. And they believed, the Jewish people at the time believed, that God was contained within the ark, within this box. That as he was carried into battle, into new land, as God promised they would have and would win, as long as the ark was with them, they won all these things, because they firmly believed that God was within the box. That was the theology and the thinking in those days of the Jewish people. And they built the tabernacle. Remember, the ark rested in the tabernacle when they weren't carrying it. Tabernacle was a mobile temple before the stone temple of Solomon was built, a permanent structure. The tabernacle was built exactly to God's, uh, God's reasoning, God's will and God's instructions. And taken down the same way, carried the same way. As he instructed. And the ark was the same. Only the Levites could carry it. No one else was to touch it. 
And the Ark of the Covenant, in an analogous sense, is seen here in heaven because nobody knows who the Ark of the Covenant is. The actual box itself has simply disappeared. And there are people even today who search for it. Some believe it's in Jerusalem, buried somewhere. Some people believe it is in Rome. And you see those wonderful films like Indiana Jones and uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant, trying to find that, all that type of stuff. That's still uh, going on. But remember that this is speaking of God's presence within the presence of a temple in heaven. And there are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and heavy hail. Here we have the judgment side of God again coming out as he continues to be angry at the world and where it is in the middle of all the tribulation. And as we finish and we think of this picture of heaven at the very end, God's temple there, the Ark of the Covenant seen within that temple, the very presence of God. In fact, some believe that Jeremiah in his time uh, as a historical thing took the Ark of the Covenant to Mount Nebo and is buried there somewhere. There's another instance of it too. And remember Mount Nebo, that area is where Moses died and was never found again. So there's all sorts of connections there too. But remember, this is the presence of God in his judgment, sitting in his temple, the Ark of the Covenant, his presence. And as we move on then to chapter 12 next time, which is about the woman and the dragon. So we have two more characters coming in now to the story of Revelation and who they are. Well, thank you for joining with us today and we're going to pray now. Do join us again uh, next week for chapter 12 and feel free to read it even beforehand as we study it together. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, quite a, a deep and dark picture in many ways of chapter 11 and uh, the work of the two witnesses that is ahead, Lord, who will bring your word and yet die uh, within that by the work of the beast but you will rise them again and take them into heaven. And Lord, for all of us yet to put our trust in you, help us to do that so that we will be with you uh, in heaven and part of that temple, part of the glorious presence of eternity with you. So Lord, help us to be mindful, to be wise of the seasons, to be wise of what is coming ahead as revelation fulfills itself. And be prepared for your return, which can be at any time. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you safe. Amen.